to have passion in life is everything. What's your Everest? Oh, is it yeah. that 200-inch box? They just look so impressive when they're wide. Especially running away. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Eastman's Elevated. It's like a think tank for outdoor activity. It sounds exactly like my hunting. Just always thinking about it, always trying to evolve it and make it better. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Yo, what's happening, guys? Got a brand new Eastman's Elevated for you. So on today's podcast, I back on my friend Marlon Holden. Uh, so I've got to know Marlon over the last few years through social media, through having on this podcast, and then other private conversations as well. And he's just one of those guys that is consistently successful with his bow on mule deer. Uh, he's a specialist, so he only hunts mule deer and only hunts him with his bow and arrow. Uh, and he's committed himself to it. And, and I just love getting inside the mind of guys that that have really committed themselves to the cause or really dedicated themselves to it and ha- have shown through uh, consistent success they get it done year after year that, that that they have the right formula and so to get inside somebody's head like that was um, really fun for me uh, we had this great in-depth conversation on today's podcast so we go deep we talk about the meaning of life uh i leave the beginning part in as we kind of talk about where we live and and uh we kind of start opening up to each other and talk about a few things so i just left it in the podcast it's a long episode hopefully it'll entertain you down the road i know it entertained me i got a lot out of it and uh had a lot of fun um talking in depth with them so um yeah we'll get right into it just want to thank a couple sponsors I want to thank Black Ovis. Uh, Black Ovis, uh, they're an online retail store. So they have all the top brands, uh, everything you could need for hunting season. And and they're hunters themselves. Uh, They hunt and they support us hunters. I saw them at TAC and I saw them at the Western Hunting Expo. And and they told me personally too that they want to help with any projects I have going on. Like they they are invested in the, the Western hunting culture, hunting culture in general. So just great guys. I love to support them they also have tons of promos so you can save 10 percent if you put in elevated 10 uh, at checkout they also have a points deal and it's not you know one point equals five cents or you know you need five thousand points to equal a dollar it's one point versus one dollar and you get these points back on every purchase there through black ovis so uh, if you're in the market for anything hunting gear make sure to check them out you can get uh, multiple points back, which is going to help you with more purchasing power. Great company, great brands. If you're in the market for any of that, make sure to go check them out at Black Ovis. Also, go check out Camo Fire. Uh, Camo Fire is a way to save on hunting gear. So uh, they have 80 different deals that come up every 24 hours. Uh, They give up to 70% off on some of these items. And so you can pick up some great gear for a great price. Uh, So go check it out over on Camo Fire. I also want to thank Zamberlin Boots. I've been using Zamberlin Boots for the last few years, and I'm so impressed. I'm so impressed by their uh, construction, their durability, uh, their thoughtfulness, and and lately they've been coming out with these shoes. Uh, so I absolutely love them. Uh, I have the the Saluth 215 is probably my favorite shoe out there, and it's a a burly shoe with a Vibram sole, and it holds up to a season worth of abuse. Uh, it's also waterproof. It keeps my feet dry, and it keeps my feet dry for not just the first month that I have them, but the the first couple of years. Like they're still waterproof. They actually test every Gore-Tex booty to make sure that it's waterproof. So um, uh, both boots in your shoes are both Gore-Tex booties. They have tested those ones individually to make sure they're waterproof. They just don't cut any corners when it comes to craftsmanship, when it comes to materials. They're under two pounds a pair. And you think a, a pound on your foot is like 10 pounds on your back. And and think about an extra pound on your feet if you're taking 40,000 steps a day on a hunt. That's 40,000 extra pounds you have to lift. So I love lightweight footwear. But they've got all different kinds of options for every different preference you could think of. So uh, I love that Salute 215 is my favorite shoe. Uh, this year I'm trying out uh, a new shoe that they have. Um, so they've got, uh, a, um, 
got to remember the name, the Anabasis. Uh, so I'm using the Anabasis shoe this year. It's a th- synthetic, waterproof shoe, lightweight. Uh, can't wait to try it out. I've been breaking them in as I've been scouting and super impressed. Uh, for a boot, if you like a low-cut boot that's lightweight, under three pounds, my favorite one is that 320 Trail Light Evo GTX. Uh, that thing is a great boot boot and just stands up to years of abuse. Uh, so I'll be using that boot as well, but just, um, so many great options. Uh, the, the best shoes and boots on the market. Uh, if you're, if you're going to be walking this hunting season, which we all are, make sure to go check out Zamblin. They, they offer some great footwear. I also want to thank Cutter Stabilizers. So Cutter Stabilizers is run by Earl Stroll. Uh, he's a, a small business owner. Uh, he's a bow hunter just like us, and he came up with this idea for Cutter Stabilizers. So uh, I worked with him for, you know, I've been using Cutter Stabilizers now the last three or four seasons at least, but he's really evolved uh, his construction of these stabilizers to make sure that they're stout and they're going to hold up to our abuse. They're carbon fiber, so they're light. You can add one ounce increments to them. He also has a sidebar adjustment on it or attachment on it uh, that'll hook up a sidebar. And I've been shooting a sidebar for the last 10 years. Helps so much on stability on the hold of the bow and also the reaction of the bow. So I'm shooting a a 15 out front. I'm shooting a 12 in back. I'm shooting six ounces out front. I'm shooting 10 ounces in the back. So I pretty much add a pound to my setup, but the thing just holds rock solid. Uh, So uh, I absolutely love cutter stabilizers. Um, Earl Stroll is a a great guy, the owner of the company. uh, And and I thank him for his support of the podcast. So if you're in the market for any new stabilizers, make sure to go check them out over at cutter. And man, um, we launched that mule deer school for Eastman. So you do not need to be part of tag hub to purchase. Uh, You can just search uh, uh, Eastman's, uh, mule deer hunting course and uh, it'll pop up uh, really proud how it came out we're continuing to work away on it and improve it adding stuff all the time I've got a shot list for this hunt in fact I'm leaving uh, tomorrow morning for the drive tomorrow afternoon to hike in uh, first hunt of the year high country mule deer hunt so um, super stoked on it but uh, yeah make sure to go check out that that mule deer course if you're interested in it it's just got a ton of information hunting mule deer a to z uh, definitely gonna pick up some some tips and tactics and cut your learning curve by years uh, just by taking this course and and it's um, you can take it as a beginner or you can take it as an expert and I find myself reviewing the course getting lost in the information as well uh, picking up and 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 confirming you know stuff that I that I already know that I forget that I'll use use towards my next hunt to make sure I'm successful. So make sure to check out that, uh, Eastman's mule deer school. And, um, man, with that, let's get into this podcast. So I go deep with Marlon, man, this is a really fun conversation. So we talk about a lot of different things, but all centered around the mountains, around hunting mule deer, uh, around what it means to us, our, our mindset going into it. Uh, just, a a great, fascinating conversation. So I really appreciate Marlon, uh, being so honest and open on the podcast and coming on and sharing his time. We talk for, uh, this podcast is almost two hours long, so it's a long one for you guys, but, uh, I really really had a lot of fun. Uh, I really like that guy, Marlon, and, and sure appreciate him coming on. And um, yeah, let's get into it. I'm your host, Brian Barney, Eastman's Elevated. Here we go. Hey, brother. Can, can, can you hear me good? Oh, I got you. Perfect. Okay, cool. Uh, for whatever reason, I wasn't able to sign in on my computer. I don't know why, but it's letting me sign in on my phone. <laughs> um, yeah, the, these programs, uh, uh, seems like you got to hack into the matrix to be able to get on, and then they always want to update or something. It's crazy. Dude, it's so weird. If you were to look at my screen right now on my computer, it's going in this, like, circle. I'm <laughs> like, Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can... my username and password and it's just sitting here going unfortunately skype is not available right now i'm like i'm on skype on my phone <laughs> oh it's so difficult yeah, yeah it's um skype seems to be the best program for my audio it's just my internet at my house they've got me running off old copper and i tried to run off elon musk 
uh, satellite system there for a while and uh, had an issue with that. Like it was just inconsistent. Uh, mm-hmm. But I'm I'm finally going to get fiber optics, which is going to be really nice. Oh, wow, that's cool. Yeah. So are you are you like like are you out in the in the sticks or what? What's your <laughs> Kind Where of. are you? <laughs> kind, of? <laughs> kind of, yeah. Um, I'm 60 miles south of Bozeman, so I'm in this little community of Ennis, Montana, with about 2,000 full-time residents that balloons up to 5,000 full-time residents. And so uh, I'm on five acres. I'm in a development. But the problem is I'm in a, a newer development. And so they kind of replace this these copper lines with fiber optics as they see necessary or as they see fit. And so since we're a new development, we still have good Good copper wire, so we're like the last development to get fiber optics. You realize, gosh, you live such a blessed life. Oh, dude, it's so it's awesome such- to to be able to live in this small community, to raise my girls here, to have a a good school, and then the the view out my house is looking out at these eleven thousand foot peaks. Man, I am so fortunate. Like, pay, like life is just a little bit slower around here, a little bit more relaxed. It's such a great place to live. What did I do wrong? What did I... <laughs> You're questioning everything. Like, it's so funny because we pick our path, right? We all pick our path. Um, and in a lot of ways, I feel like I picked such a great path. Like, I'm, I feel really fulfilled. Um, I'm super happy. Um, I'm following a dream and I work according to like, you know, for the most part, I would say I work according to like what, what I desire. Um, it's interesting though, because of my business, because of my, my, uh, art gallery, I have to be in like a crazy high traffic, high net worth place otherwise it doesn't work right but i live in this place that requires so much money and the gallery nets you know uh nets pretty well um but like the expenses are so high at the end of the day it's like uh, the equivalent of living a good life you know i would say just about anywhere like i could probably live off of way less if I were to go somewhere that didn't require, like, for example, um, the house that I live in is, uh, 1700 square feet small. It's a three bedroom, uh, three bathroom, two car garage. It's got a 20 foot cement slab in the back, no front yard. I'm in a cul-de-sac with, you know, um, 10 other houses. It's like six grand a month. Wow. Plus a gate fee. The front gate is like 1200 a month. It's a gated community. Um, so like, you know, and, and then you got taxes and all that crap on top of it. It's like, uh, it's like for me just to like, have a house that mo- and and uh, trust me when I say this if you FaceTime me like my house is you know nothing special inside yeah it's got granite countertops and stainless appliances it's like okay and most people that work hard or whatever I don't know what to say about it. it's not it's not anything that uh I would imagine that your house doesn't have right like it, your house is probably going to look better on the inside than mine does and then you have this view and you have this land. You can go out back and probably shoot your bow. Um, that that just doesn't exist here. I mean, I'm in Orange County, Southern California, uh, where I got to drive, you know, 15 minutes to shoot my bow. But thank goodness I found a few places I can actually shoot it around here because people see you. They're kind of like, whoa, what are you doing? <laughs> 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 you know? Um, and and it's interesting because like my goal is to like, it's like I'm doing it in reverse or something because my goal is to, you know, I want to buy like a small ranch. I want to buy, you know, a couple thousand acres and, um, literally 
let somebody graze some cattle on it and have a little house away from the cow shit part of it and be able to drive down a dirt road in total serenity and be able to freaking just call it a day. Like that, that's what I want to do. Have a little archery range on it. Um, have a couple horses, have a couple dogs, um, maybe a, you know, a tack room on it with a freaking couple cats. Like, you know, just like, I want to slow it way down and call it way different and be, you know, an hour out of town somewhere, maybe even two hours out of town somewhere. Like that's my vision of what, you know, 20 years from now can look like. And the funny part about it is Brian, um, is that in 20 years from now, I'll be over 60 and I might not be able to live that kind of life for a long time before I need somebody else's help to do it. (laughs) So it's like, (laughs) what, what am I doing? You know, I don't know. I have, I guess sometimes I have those moments where, um, I just think about it. I, it's a, a, you know, self-reflection. That's all. Yeah. But dude, so rad to like be on the phone with you right now. Um, I haven't talked to you in, in, it seems like way too long. And I got, I, I put out this message the other day just talking about, uh, how many, who do you know that has over 50, um, mule deer bucks with their bow? Do it yourself, unguided. And, and it's funny because like I got no responses. And then I'm like, I think Brian does. Like I put out that out there and I want to say 20, 20, over 2400 people saw, saw my story. And it's not like that's, a lot because Instagram cuts the knee, cuts it off the knees. But out of 2,400 hunters, you know, there's like nobody had heard of anybody. And I thought that was odd. I'm like, Hmm, people were mentioning, you know, I'm sure, you know, Chuck Adams has, you know, 50 kills. And I'm like, I'm not fit talking about 50 kills. I want to talking about 50 mule deer. Cause like, you know, I have hundreds of kills of pigs and sheep and, and axis deer and stuff when I lived in Hawaii, but that was like for food. I'm talking about mule deer. Like how many mule deer like has, you know, somebody dedicated themselves to killing. And that was cool that you were the only guy that I found that has killed 50. And I'm sure there's, you know, some more out there. I'm sure there's a hundred percent sure there's sleepers, but like, you're totally a unicorn, bro. It's interesting. You are too. And uh, by the way, I'm beaming to have you on the line and be able to connect with you again. Uh, but but yeah, you uh, you mentioned that that question to me or posed it to me, and so I had to do uh, some quick math of how many years and how many mule deer. But uh, that's why you're a specialist. Like, um, uh, and, and the 2,400 people that you reached are all hardcore Western hunters, or at least the majority of them. And so, uh, yeah, that's pretty amazing. It had me pondering it for uh, for a while, for the last couple days until I get you on the phone now, but. What an, an amazing feat, and that's um, it, it's something that that both of us have have structured our life to do as much of as possible. Uh, but but it's a a pretty amazing accomplishment when you sit back and think about it, and think about how few guys really have killed fifty mule deer with their bow, and that that experience is is the best teacher around. Like it's a, a experience. You know, it it shapes our instincts, it hones our instincts and our decision making process. So we're, you know, when we get a chance at a big buck or we get a stock on a mule deer, uh, we just start making decisions. And there's a hundred of these right decisions that have to go right to be able to arrow that buck. And I think the reason why we have a better chance than most is we've been in a lot of different situations and we let the those those hunting instincts guide us and over time those instincts keep sharpening and keep getting better and that's not to mention you know not only the mule deer that we've killed but what about the scouting trips and the the scouting days and i know you're scouting hard right now for your hunts coming up this fall as well as i am but uh, the days of field uh, uh really gives us the edge as far as bow hunting mule deer i feel like you know what the weird part about is, is too, Brian, is that I don't even really feel like the scouting necessarily, I find the animal that I'm going to shoot. <laughs> Sounds weird. 
very rarely do I scout and go kill the animal that I'm going to shoot. But I feel like I connect with the land. Like, you know, you ever, you ever jump on, um, start playing a video game or you ever like go somewhere new and it just takes you a few few days to just feel like you're a part of it or it takes you a little while to, to kind of feel like, oh, I'm here, you know? And, and it's like, you're just kind of like synthesizing. You're kind of like, I'm a tourist, you know, but give me a few days and I'm not going to be a tourist anymore. I'm going to like understand kind of what's going on. It's like, it's like scouting is almost that precursor that says, um, Oh, you're plugged in. Oh, you're it's, it's like, there's this information highway that lets you know what's going on. And if you don't scout, you just don't know. And it really has, for me over the years become less and less about finding the buck I'm going to shoot and more about becoming one with the land. Mm, I love that Marlon, uh, in sync with the landscape. Um, you're, you're absolutely a hundred percent right is I don't, uh, usually find the deer that I'm going to kill, but it, it's getting comfortable in the, that scenario and in that situation and in that landscape. You know, for me, it's getting comfortable with being in the mountains and, and dealing with weather, dealing with steep terrain, dealing with the climbs, being able to camp out there. And like you said, like, um, getting in sync with it. And over the years, like I've realized, you know, why I hunt. Um, you know, uh, I'm always pushing for success and I'm pushing to arrow a buck. That's my goal. But really for me, it's the adventure and it's the time spent out in the mountains. And so why skew that to such a small time period, uh, in the fall to be hunting when I can stretch it over the summer and, and on these scouting trips, I am hunting. Like the only thing I don't do is stalk and shoot a buck with my bow, but, uh, it's all the, the same mechanics of, of being in the mountains and, and hiking these peaks and finding camping locations and, and glassing, you know, with my binos and with my scope and, and being able to pick out these bucks and watch them. And I get, uh, those, those jolts of excitement too, or those, those rushes of adrenaline when I find a good buck in velvet and keep my eyes on them. And so uh, I think you're absolutely right is it's, it's getting in sync with the mountains where if we just go on these hunts and have to sync up with those mountains and, and dial into this predator prey relationship, like it's going to take us a few days to get our bearings. But when we scout and spend this time in the mountains or like me too, like trail running for me is being in the mountains. And I've just found that, that I love it so much that I want to spend as much time as I can. But you're right. You spend that time and you really get synced in with your environment. So when you show up to hunt, you're dialed in and ready to, to get after it. Yeah. It's – so this is going to be one of the very first conversations I'll ever have with another human being. And this sounds really weird. I respect you for days. Always have. Um but this is one of the very few conversations that I'll respect from here on out for years to come. Um, because I always consider my source unless, uh, somebody has a sensibility or a keen intuition that has the ability to match or exceed mine. Very rarely do I heed advice. Very rarely do I sit there and go, hmm, okay, I'll listen. I'll, I'll totally listen because I have this philosophy and, and I live by it. It's if you're green, you're growing. If you're ripe, you're ripe. You think you know too much, you're going to stop growing and you're on your way to death. Like you got to always stay listening. But very seldom do I ever hear something where it's like, ooh, that makes a lot of sense. Usually it's kind of like, wow, there's a lot of inexperience talking there and that makes no sense at all. You, sh- you should not go that way. That That's a bad stocking route or why would we go over there the wind's going to start here in the morning and we don't want to you know be out of the shadows we want to be in the shadows like we want to walk we want to go to the other side of the mountains so that way you know as we're walking this ridge we can look at the bedding areas like you know and, and just my mind is like it kind of think you just like yours it has to think different um it has to think different if you're gonna if you're gonna if 
your hunt is going to go the way that you want it to go, your mind has to think differently. And you, you have the insight to be able to speak to it to such a degree that so many don't have the ability to. And so you hear often uh, a lot of people's opinions going back and forth. Like, I'm the most basic dude ever in the world. I don't change much from year to year. Yes, uh, you know, I'll get sent a new bow. Um, but... I don't change my broadheads. I don't change my range rider. I don't tinkle with boots. I don't do broadhead tests. I don't change my arrows. I don't fuck with anything. Like it, it all stays the same. And they're like, well, what about this broadhead? What about that broadhead? I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these ones kill really good. <laughs> like not an animal has walked away from them. So I'm not sure why I would go do that. You know, and, and well, you should try expandables. And I'm like, well, they're illegal in a couple of states. So if I decide one day I want to hunt Oregon, why am I ever going to try something that I'm going to have to go screw with something else with in order to try and hunt it? And as I've heard from some of my friends, every now and then, like one out of, you know, 50 animals, they've had a bad experience where it deployed and entered weird and came out the other side strange. And so, no, I'm cool. And I'm not saying you don't use them. You might use them. I'm just, I'm just one of those weirdos that's like, I'm, I just don't change anything because I found like a recipe that works and I'm good with it. Like, I'm not going to change anything that's not broken. And maybe that holds me back a little bit, but I haven't seen where since in your case too, like you've been able to excel to such a degree. What, why would you change it? You've literally built your life around hunting. Yep. Uh, likewise. Um, that's a powerful statement you made. And I'm, um, you know, we definitely have so many similarities, but we also have differences. Like there's more than one way to kill a buck and you, you start to learn these preferences you have and you believe in them, but I'm with you, uh, people that want to give me advice that, that haven't, you know, harvested as many mule deer or as many elk. Like, uh, uh, see, I'm an expandable guy, and my theory on it is, is that that one bad experience that you're talking about is shot placement. Like for me, I'm all about accuracy and forgiveness, and so I've shot expandables uh, for the last 12 years, and I've seen a bunch of animals die, and and they're really accurate out at ranges. They collect less wind drift. They're really forgiving, and so I'm all about accuracy and putting that arrow in the right spot. So, but I get guys that want to convince me to shoot something else or to shoot. And actually, uh, Oregon and Idaho just passed rules where now you can shoot expandables in them. Not that that's going to change your mind. And I'm not saying you should change your mind. Like like what you that. use works for you. There is no reason to change. You have them dialed in accurate. You practice with them into your target and shoot groups with broadheads only. Like you're dialed. There is no reason to change. There's no reason to be convinced of anything else. I'm in a different camp, but I'm in... The the same camp is, is I'm not going to let somebody else dictate what I'm going to shoot because I have my personal experience. I also have the experience of good friends. I know that these broadheads, when I hit them in lungs, heart, or liver, they die every single time. And and if you don't hit that, you got maybe a 10% chance to get them. So I'm in the, the forgiveness and accuracy, and I, I have shot fixed blades. Like, I've had to shoot them in Idaho. I've done really well, but I have to work with them longer, you know, and I have to work with them more to make sure that they're accurate. Um but it is funny how um, everybody wants to give advice of what you should use or what you should do uh, when when uh, uh, experience is the best teacher. And when you've been through all these trials and tribulations and you have this gear that you trust, that's what you use and what you go to, you know, and there's a reason for it. And so uh, I'm the same way as I don't want to tell anybody what they should use or what they should do. I share what I use or what works for me, and then um, uh, you know I try to give both sides to the story because there's definitely uh, advantages and disadvantages of both ways you go for every item in your pack, just like broadheads. Advantages to disadvantages for both fixed blade and expandables. You like it because you know you don't have to worry about something opening up, and any more moving parts on any of your gear is a chance for things to go wrong. And so for you, you know 
that those broadheads are going to kill when you put them in the middle. You work with your accuracy. They shoot really well for you. There's no reason to change. And same for me. Yeah, it's pretty freaking amazing. And, and I love how it just really, at the end of the day, it has to do with like our confidence the, the day that our boot hits the ground. It, it It's this more than anything else it just has to do with the mentality that we have when we get out of the, out of our beds and you know we hit the mountain it's crazy it, it's such a i don't know it's such a different and an amazing and magical thing because there's more than hope behind it it's like um, in, in a lot of things in life, you know, we're like, we, we're good parents, care about our children, and we want the best for them. But no matter what, like, you know, all the confidence we are being good parents and everything like that, we hope that they're going to do well in life, right? Um, and the better we do with those things, the better chance they have at doing well in life. And I just feel like, you know, it's no different with hunting or anything else. It's like we're going to just work so hard to try and keep things in a place where we've controlled as much as we can to make sure that the outcome turns out a certain way. And, you know, we're going to pour our hearts into it and hopefully we end up where we want to. And the more and more you stack up, we're like, no, this is a recipe. We're going to go make bread today. Um and it's really cool. Anyway, when uh, it got tangent before we even started on. <laughs> we're going to go on. This, but... No, we're started. Heck, I'm recording. This is uh, I know to always hit record when I get you on the line. So we'll just um, start it from the beginning. But yeah, it, it, dude, it all starts and ends with the mind. Right. And with everything in life. And it's wild how with bow hunting, the lessons I've learned and um, the skill sets that I've built that I can apply this to all avenues of life. And, and, you know, I apply it to, to being a father or being a husband. Like we learn all these great lessons in the mountains, you know, uh, uh, about uh, uh, determination, about grit, uh, about dedication, you know, and it's, it's not a year of hard work. It's year after year after year of living this, this bow hunting lifestyle. And, and through this, like like we can be whatever we want to be in life. We just have to make up our mind. There's there's so much opportunity out there, and it just starts with this vision, or it starts with this thought of I want to be great at bow hunting mule deer. Now it isn't something you can do in one day, one week, one month, one year, but it's something that you can work towards this higher goal. And if you continue uh, to put in the work. Day after day, you start to improve your skill set and you start to build this recipe that you're talking about, right? And so, like, uh, uh, starts and ends with the mind, and that goes from prior to the hunt, preparing the hunt, on the hunt, uh, after the hunt, and, and and also just, like, trying to build this, this recipe that works for you. And your recipe is a touch different from mine, but being a student of the game, like your analogy earlier about learning, and when you – quit learning you die and i i think it's such a great analogy is that you have to be a student of the game and so when i talk to you i'm actually taking pages from your book uh like they're uh your style of hunting as as we're so similar and we have a bunch of things that tie together we also have these differences and so when you speak i listen a and you may have some preferences or we have to build how aggressive and how patient we're going to be and and where we're going to be patient where we choose to stock or where we don't choose to stock how we cover country how we glass like there's there's so much involved in there and me and you have both built our separate recipes through 25 years of bow hunting mule deer uh, but then I get to take a page from your your book and I get to apply it to my own hunting where it fits in and goes you know Marlon really likes to hunt and kill these deer in their beds I need to look for more of those opportunities to kill these bucks before this wind switches around that's a page from your book that I can put in mind that I can improve my hunting and so you know guys out there nowadays 
it's the information day and age. And I believe it's the good old days of mule deer hunting. Like I hear guys talk about the 70s and, and all the big muley bucks that are around. And, and, and I'm sure it was great hunting. But in today's day and age, with all this information we have, there's still great opportunity out there. And there's great opportunity. And even though there's more hunting pressure out there, and hunting pressure is definitely an element of our hunting, there there's still – this possibility to go find your own experience out there and not see humans or find your own experience and find your own bucks. And usually the bucks are where the humans aren't, at least the big ones. And so as you start to find these locations, you start to have more and more success, but uh, wholeheartedly agree with you. It starts and ends with the mind and you can do anything you want to do in life. You just have to set your mind towards it and start working towards this, this macro goal. Yeah, that, that's, it's, it's absolutely so true, Brian. A couple things kind of hit home. Um, you know, you'd sp- spoken about hitting the mountain. And one of the things that I feel like living in the mountains on a consistent basis has taught me more than anything else is humility. Like, it, it's ta- it teaches me how, how truly unprepared I am. And I don't know if you feel this way or not, because you, you arguably, I would say you probably, you, you live in the mountains. Um, you know, I have to drive seven hours just to get to a, a, a mountain where I'd even consider hunting. Um, and so I have to be very intentional about the way I spend my time in order to be there. But when I'm there, like for example, any of the high country for me is, you know, anywhere between 14 to 16 hours away. Um, but I'll go at least four times a year and I'll stay a minimum of a week to 10 days each time. I don't care whether I'm scouting, I'm, uh, looking for camping locations, uh, uh, getting acclimated, uh, taking photography, landscape photos. It d- doesn't matter. I, I want to be in the country, but the biggest thing is, is humility. Like, so I found I, I found this back route this last trip just what three days ago. Um, I found this new route into some country. Um, we hit the trailhead at one thirty in the morning um, to get you know to the top by first light, and you're probably like I could trail run that in like two hours, but you know since I'm two hundred and frickin' forty pounds. And I move a slightly slower pace. Um, I don't run anything. I just hike and keep going. And so I start early. But it was, you know, 30, 3,400 feet of elevation gain. And, like, I had to cover seven and a half miles, and which isn't a big deal for a lot of people. But for me, it's kind of like a go at it. And... Um, you know, I'm like, oh, it, you know, Google Earth. See, here's here's the big kicker. Uh, you know, anybody who is listening to this, right? Google Earth is kind of like a head fake because, generally speaking, if you think you can get over something in Google Earth, think twice because when you get there, you're like, whoa, this is a little bit gnarlier than I thought. <laughs> so here I am. It's like freaking dark. It's you know, two hours before the sun's gonna come up. We got we're up 1,200 feet. Um, headlamps scrambling up this freaking class three sketchy like traverse trying to get over and out of this bowl and we're up at the edge of it at like 12 7 and it's dark and not like it's scary or anything it's just is what it is you put one foot in front of the other right but it was sketchy you get to the top of it and then you start traversing this rim up further because we're going to end up at like you know 13 three, 13, four, something like that. And, you know, um, and, and, you know, we started it down in the timber. So like the one section was pretty mellow. You're going through trees and whatnot, which is not a big deal. And then you get out of the trees and then you start traversing into the high country and then you know you get to these sketchy sections that were on google earth it looks like it's literally like 50 feet but in reality it's probably more like you know 300 yards and it's sketchy and you know it's in the dark and and i guess that's where 
I was bringing it back to this uh, um, humility thing. But it just, I'm always humbled. No matter how much I work out or no matter how much I train or no matter how much I think I'm in good shape or no matter how much I think I'm ready, the mountains just always say, you know what, Marlon? You will never be ready for me. No matter how ready you think you are, you will never be ready for me. And I'm going to allow you to be in my presence right now. But know that your clock's ticking. It's not going to be forever. So hang on to every single day you got here because it's a blessing to be in this sketchy spot right now. And stay humble because that's your place. Like, no matter how confident you are, like, if your confidence is wavering and you're just not this necessarily confident person that goes through life just feeling like you can accomplish whatever you want, I think the mountains are going to make those people leave their hunts early. And the best thing that we could do, you know, I mean, with, with it, the age of the Internet and after COVID, it seemed like, you know, hunting and everything, everybody wanted to get outdoors and it surged and we saw a lot more traffic in the mountains. It was a whole different kind of ball of wax. It's almost like, ah, we don't want any more people in the mountains. I don't want to encourage any more to any more people to come do this. But at the same time, if that's going to happen, like, let's encourage people how to do it, at least, you know, in what, what way we could deem as potentially a better way to do it than go about it just doing dumb things that end up screwing it up for the rest of us you know skylining uh seeing somebody hunker down on a buck and continuing to come get closer to see what's going on silly goofy moves that really can be avoided that you know people shouldn't be trying to just run around pushing bucks all over country on opening morning when the thermals haven't shifted yet and screwing a bunch of other people up on stocks so, like there's little things that we can do to just help um if people are going to be in the country let's treat each other with respect let's do it right and always remain humble because the country will humble us and the people that don't have the confidence like help them push through barriers to allow them to know that it's possible you just have to believe it's possible um i don't know just something you said there uh, when you were talking a while back it just made me think of that. And then the other thing is, um, I had to jump into this. I didn't have to, I jumped into, to bow hunting, you know, 16 years ago with like this, uh, this kind of like this dream of pursuing this monarch, monarch of the mountain. Like, mule deer represented i don't know whenever i just saw big snow-capped mountains with alpine and sagebrush like my heart started to beat faster i'm like what are these creatures they're just freaking epic in every way you see a big buck turn its head to look back and you and i can both think of many times in our life where we've seen that view and i know you feel that way about elk too um where you're just like wow I, I just don't know that there's anything on earth that does that to me like a pig doesn't do it an axis deer doesn't do it a mouflon ram doesn't do it but for me an elk doesn't do it um antelope sure as heck doesn't do it like a bear not even close like you know just but a mule deer does it and I'm like, I, I'm giddy. Like, I just don't even know that hunting would be not, not, not as significant to me if mule deer didn't exist. So I, I guarantee you, like, the latter part of my life is going to emphasize and focus on what I can do to give back. As a matter of fact, publicly, I'm going to put this out there if I can. Um... I would love for some way for my artwork to help impact and benefit mule deer. So like pick photographs that I have of the high country or whatever. Um, if it's the right cause and it makes sense, I want to work with people 
to help better habitat and help protect mule deer range and help feeding programs and things of that nature um, with my artwork. I've been, tr- I've, I've been wanting, I've been meaning to and wanting to get a hold of uh, the guys at Mule Deer Foundation. Um, I've actually, since Miles left, I've actually uh, tried to reach the new chairman, um, has not responded to my email yet. And so I'm hoping that I can get a hold of him because I want to do some stuff with them to help benefit mule deer habitat, uh, through my artwork. Uh, and, and, you know, we can completely block that out of this conversation and whatnot, but it's just something that as I get older, I'm feeling more passionate about, um, and feeling more that I could have a contributing part in a bigger way that instead of just throwing money at it, uh, I can make it more of a cultural based movement that something that I do can help impact that. And and the older I get, the more and more and more important that's going to become. The more established I am in my life and what I do. And it's not so much, well, are you going to make it? Can you retire? Is life going to be okay? Where it's going to be like, there's this excess. I want that excess to be able to go toward things that matter the most and aside from my son that would be habitat and mule deer and keeping public lands open uh, keeping hunting alive things like that i think are so important Um, and as we're living lives rising gas prices like the uncertainty of economies of world wars of gosh so many different things covid monkeypox i mean it's like we have so much stuff coming at us it's like we're dodging balls like all day long you know to sit there and think about something as lofty as hey let's make sure that our public lands stay open and that hunting doesn't get shut down and like let's be careful to try and you know get together to do something about wolf introduction or what predator management that's just a plethora of different things that it's becoming a much more present and center centered um thought process for me brian so sorry for the long rant just kind of a couple of things that you know made me think about a couple of things you had said that for me it's only been a 16 year journey and now it feels kind of long but uh it's been such a a great last few you know the last little over a decade that that chapter for me and mule deer has been shorter it hasn't been this lifetime consumptive i haven't been i didn't know what they even were i didn't know what a mule deer was like if you were to ask me what a mule deer was probably 17 years ago i I would be like i don't even know what you're talking about like what is that it's 28 years old just blissfully thinking about blue marlin and wahoo and tuna and you know just don't even know what a mule deer is so this is kind of like a a different kind of perspective for me dude that's um that is so beautiful i uh your art is going to do great things for mule deer your perspective uh there there is it's no mystery to me why your art gallery does so well for you you're uh, perspective on these photos like um, uh, uh, when I when I look at them uh, your art moves me uh, far more than any art that I've ever seen like uh, uh, your photographs are absolutely next level and I you know I I have a camera and I try to capture good photos and I I have some good ones that I'm proud at but nowhere near the level that you're at and um, also your your love for these these wild places like um we're the lucky ones. We found our passion in life, something that we love wholeheartedly that's not tied to, to monetary benefit. It's not our work. It's our it's our love. It's something that, that we're willing to, to work hard at and put all this effort in to, to, to be better, just to give ourselves a chance at success. And so I think that's a beautiful thing. And, and um, yeah, I definitely, uh, if you don't hear back from Mule Deer Foundation, you know, I'll try to work my contacts as well to put you in contact with 
with them because I think it'll really help mule deer. It'll really help hunters. And I, uh, uh, I think, um, uh, more mule deer hunters like me, like finding your art, uh, it's moving the, the shots that you can get. So there's, there's no doubt in my mind that that'll do great things for mule deer. And I think, um, I think it's your aura too, like just the way you approach life, the way you approach mule deer hunting, the way you approach your photography, like I can see it in your shots. I can, you know, I feel like I'm looking through your eyes when I see it and, and some of it it is just amazing. Like not only do you find the best scenery, but you time that scenery perfectly with the bloom of the flowers or perfectly with the sunset perfectly with the wave crashing over like you 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 see this picture in your mind and you're able to to create like uh the most beautiful time in the most beautiful places and capture that through your camera so uh i i think that's huge and i i just want to touch on a couple things you said as well like i i already have a page of notes talking to you marlon like it just reminds me of of so many uh, so many things in the mountains, like you talk about humility and, and being humbled. Um, these mountains are so much bigger when we get there in person. You can look at all the maps, all the Google Earth you want. You get there, and they're so much bigger. They're awe-inspiring. And, and those miles in elevation that you talked about, the, the 3,400 or to get to your spot that you just went in this last trip, like that's a that's a push for anybody. And I think these hunts, like I get a picture in my mind how this hunt's going to go. And, and mule deer, my love for them, it's definitely the species. Like I love how they've evolved thousands of years of avoiding mountain lions that are really stealthy and really good at sneaking up. And if I had to kill a mule deer uh, with my teeth and claws, I'd have a lot fewer of them to, to my credit than I do with a bow and arrow. Like those mountain lions are so stealthy. And a mountain lion comes out of the womb sneakier than we can ever be. Like you watch a kitten hunt and the patience it shows with to have a Tweety bird right in front of them four feet and to just watch it and not move until that Tweety bird's looking away and then make its move and its pounce and its jump on it. But you watch them hunt how patient and slow, methodical, calculated they are. Uh, they're absolute killing machines. And these mule deer, uh, they're a product uh, of the predators that chase them. And so they're a product of these these mountain lions that hunt them. And so they they get really good instincts, really keen, really good in their environment, keeping themselves safe. But it's not only the species that I love and a, a giant mule deer. It's also the habitat it takes me to. And I love all the different habitats I get to go to, the 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 breaks, the badlands, the foothills, the desert, the and, and then the high country is like the the uh, the the crown jewel. You know, the high country is the most extreme environment that you can go bow hunt in. And these mule deer, you know, they live in places where you'd expect to see sheep and goats. And a lot of time, you do see sheep sheep and goats up there. They live, you know, in these alpine basins. And you talked about the sketchy nature of the last climb you made to climb out of this basin uh like you life is so nerfed and protected like uh in our cars and in our homes and uh you know hit the tap and the water comes out but back there it's like raw and real and so when you immerse yourself in that environment all of a sudden your decisions have this amazing weight to them you know that if you make the wrong decision it may be your life back there because you're right the mountains don't care who you are they don't care what you've accomplished in the past they don't care how much money you've made uh how good a shape you're in like the the mountains are uh they are humbling like you get in there and these hunts like my my point to all this is these hunts they humble me as well and i come in with confidence of knowing this recipe that i know i can harvest a mule deer and that's what continues to drive me forward but these hunts are always tougher than i expect even going to places i've been before places i've hunted before it's different every time you go there with the the weather the conditions maybe the basins i'm gonna go chase like it's it's different every time i go and it's always tougher than i can dream up in my head it's always tougher than i can imagine that takes this this other gear for me it takes this this mental toughness to continue to endure and drive forward and to be honest a lot of times on these hunts i feel like it's mission impossible 
I feel like it's really tough to make it come together and maybe I, I mess up a stock or I'm having to, to go cruise all these miles to try to find this mature buck that's going to make me happy. And sometimes it feels like it's it's mission impossible to get this done to arrow a buck in the high country. But if I continue to grind, continue to put forth effort, continue to have this good attitude uh, and, and believe in the cause and believe that it can come together, it's amazing how many times it comes together in the last day or the last couple days just through that effort and that belief. But but these these hunts – it's almost like uh, your your best game plans out the window. Like you make these plans for this hunt, and then you get there. It's tougher than you think, or you don't find bucks where you think you are, or you find hunting pressure in different locations, and so you're like forced to adapt. And, and this this adapting on a hunt, like being able to like critical thinking and and creative thinking like to be able to come up with solutions for these problems that you're facing on this hunt and and to be able to keep in that good mental space and push forward like that's the key to being successful i i feel like is to adapt evolve and overcome like none of these hunts ever go as planned there's um uh even as much confidence as i go in the mountains and knowing that i can get it done uh there's still a bit of self-doubt that creeps in here and there that i have to push out of my brain and go hey believe in the cause keep putting forth effort and, and also enjoy my experience back there i wait all year to spend this time back in the mountains and if i if I spend like I love being immersed in this challenge and part of the beautiful thing is we have to be in the present moment like uh, so much of life we're worried about the past we're worried about the future we're worried about how to solve these problems but but bow hunting in the mountains for mule deer forces you to be present in this moment to only think about the now and and that's the beautiful thing about it but but there is self-doubt that creeps in like maybe I'm not going to be able to get it done but hey Brian like you were in the wildest place in the lower 48 chasing a species that you absolutely love. Like just soak this in, bud. Like it's not going to last forever. You're not going to be able to be here forever. Whether you're successful or not, soak this in. This is the, the time that you've dreamt about all year. This is that type two fun. And it's not fun all the time. Like you're grinding. You're doing miles. You're doing elevation. It's tough. Like I've never been as worn down or exhausted as I have like on a backcountry hunt. But this is what you dream about. This is – you're in your spot right now. Like embrace this and love it and go hard. And a lot of times, more times than not, you know, I come out on top and able to arrow a nice buck in the end. But, uh, man, it's a beautiful thing, this 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 bow hunting mule deer, isn't it? It really is. And, it, and it's crazy to think about how, you know, like if we put our bucks together – were, you know, well over 100, maybe 120 of them. And I think to myself, you have that many kills in a short time, and we feel like, gosh, is this possible? It makes you wonder what, you know, somebody has been at it for, you know, a few years and hasn't had success, like what they must feel. And, and, and I got to sit there and tell you, you know, to anybody who, who would be listening for like that nugget of information, like the biggest thing you can have is an open heart that's willing to receive and this unrelenting desire to look yourself in the mirror and say, like, I can do this and, and believe in yourself. Just, just believe like, it's not that I'm a badass. It's not that I'm great. It's not that I'm good. I'm not. I'm a human. I'm a simple man that just wants to have good friends and laugh. I love a pat on the back and a high five just like anybody else does. Just believe in yourself. Like, look in the mirror and just say, I can do this. And you know what? One foot in front of the other, I'm going to do this. And before you know it, you'll be in that moment of truth where you're coming full draw and you're like, I did this. And really, that's what it is. And, you know, isn't God good? Like, at the end of the day, he gives us free will. We have, for, you know, these moments in our humble lives where, like, I talk about this all the time. The reason why, you know, I chose photography as my path is because philosophically, like, 
I'm going to go back to this land. For this moment, I'm able to walk around. I'm able to travel to different parts of the world. Like I was in a high country three days ago. In three days from today, I'm going to hop on a plane and go to Bora Bora for 12 days. Raiatea, Huahini, and I'm going to go to the South Pacific. And I'm going to go immerse myself in that. And photograph different things and bring them back for people to see. And then I'm going to go to the Faroe Islands of Iceland and Alaska. But the thing of it is, is that we're free of like a tree can't move. It's playing its part in this earth and the cycle of days and life. Right now we're not a tree. We're, we're a tree in the fact that we can't leave this earth. Like we can't go to a different planet yet. Um, so on a, on a more grand scale, we can't leave. Uh, but from an on the ground scale of being conscious of mind, opposable thumbs, a free thinker with free will and the ability to travel and move, we have, uh, this ability where our energy is tied to the matter that created us. Like, our life force, what makes Brian, Brian, that has your soul, your spirit, your sparkle of life and love for your family, your children, bow hunting, this great community of people that honestly we protect with our lives because it's our identity without it. Not sure who I would be or what life even means. Yes. My family is, is everything to me, but outside of my family, who am I if I'm not an outdoorsman? Um, so as I travel the world and I wake up at three in the morning, four in the morning, more days than I could ever, it, it to me, it's religion. Like it just doesn't bother me to wake up because I sit there and I'm able to reflect on the fact that look at this day I've been blessed with. Like I'm here to be able to, to experience the sun coming up and this magical land that I'm in right now. And this moment that I'm able to share with the ethos of this world, that each landscape that I'm in front of, every time I see a sunset, every time I see a sunrise, I realize that I'm, I'm honestly, I'm looking in the biggest mirror I will ever look at because when I die, I'm going to go back to this earth and I'm going to be a part of this earth in a very physical and real way with my ashes, my entrails, my heart, my lungs, my bones, everything will go back to this earth. And when I look at a mountain, when I look at the sea, when I look at the sky, it is everything that I am. It is everything that you are, that you are looking at yourself in every single way you could ever imagine. The ground you walk upon, the ridge that you traverse, the, the mountain that you climb, that, that that is the past lives and the past energy force of what it is that was our forefathers and the people before us and those that have come before us that we can reflect on ourselves when we look at every single mountain or every single piece of the world that we see and maybe we might love it more and respect it more and that it resonates within us to a greater degree because it is us. We are it. The mother earth is us. We are mother earth in a very real way. Like it's not, it's not science fiction. You are the earth. And when you look at it, with your eyes in the morning after traversing through the dark, like you're looking at you. And I think that, you know, there's some people that are going to be like, whoa, dude, like you're way freaking out there. And then there's some people that are going to be like, oh my God, there's this aha moment. I, I am. And it definitely speaks to me. Like, um, what a, what a great way to, to look at all these wild places that we go. Um, I, I haven't thought about it that way. I, I have like this, this deep appreciation for it. Like, um, man, it's, um, 
like life is a trip. You couldn't make this up. You couldn't make up the way the grass blows in the wind, the way the trees are, watching the birds, watching the mule deer. Like I love being immersed. Like and I, I I'm especially present. Like it, it's tough for me to to find the beauty when I'm in the concrete jungle or when I'm in these buildings. Sure, there's beauty there, and it is the it, it is you know the same earth that it is out in the wild. But there's something out in the wild that connects with me where I. I just appreciate it more. And and if you you take it in like there's there's being in the mountains and then uh there's like this appreciation of the mountains and like like man, I'm standing in a wild place to to watch this this mule deer out there or even if it's a squirrel or a bird or whatever it is, like like this place is wild, you know, to to look at the grass and the trees and the cliffs and the basins and the to to be able to to look at all this and then and then be part of it. Like the 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 reason we survived as in as humans is our ability to 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 hunt. Our ability to bring meat back for ourselves and for our tribe. Like part of that excitement that buck fever that we get that's that's tied to our dna of survival for the last 200,000 years or you know however many thousands of years that we've been around as humans but there's there's something in this this predator prey relationship where it's the most intense interaction you can get with nature like it's uh uh one thing to to look at but to be immersed in this in this hunt in this this challenge it, i i feel like i'm alive i feel like i uh appreciate things around me and i just i i i yearn for this interaction these this this intense interaction with nature and the most intense interaction with nature i found is with the bow in my hands and it's um you know it's 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 partly like I believe that that us as hunters love these animals far more than anybody else. You know, there's there's nobody that loves mule deer more than you and I, and we do anything to fight to protect them. But but it's part of it is like entering this intense interaction with these critters and being able to play this this predator prey uh, uh, a game that we play it's not even a game but this interaction to be able to take part of that is like a special thing to go to be able to spend these days chasing these critters and they're they're crafty like we were talking before it's like the ultimate challenge both physically and mentally you know it's taken me to my limits far more than than running a marathon or an ultra marathon or anything else it's just different and um i i um i, I really like that interaction I'm able to get with these species, my interaction I'm able to get with these mountains, and really makes me appreciate not only the time I get to spend there, but the life I get to live, the life I get to have, to see these wild places and have this this perspective where uh, I'm I'm immersed in it, but this perspective of of this love for it, like um, I, I think that's a beautiful thing, and that's what I strive for. And the longer that I bow hunt mule deer, I love chasing big ones i love this interaction with it but but more than that i love like just being in the mountains being able to do it successful or not like this this adventure part of it or this immersion uh, part of it is is like part of what i love and the older i get i just i appreciate my time being able to uh be in there and get those intense interactions and that's what i'm striving for in life like that's that's what i truly love and i think it's in that same vein of what you're talking about it, it it so absolutely is. I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's like you're literally, um, you know, you take words out of my mouth because, and I know that you know a lot of listeners are thinking the same thing, right? They're they're they can feel that, um, because they feel that's why we all as hunters, that's why we take to the field. It's it's. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've said this uh, to myself in my own inner dialogue. I have this burning freaking desire to be successful. Like I want to be successful. Um, but if I really, really, really think about it, if I sit back, it it's, has so little to do with the moment of execution where I actually arrow the buck. Hmm. It's the journey, right? It's the journey. Um, and it's experiencing everything that, you know, you're talking about that we just 
that we just went over. I find that every time I get on the phone with you, I have these spiritual, you know, kind of deep conversations and, and they definitely take away from like tips or tactics or anything like that. But you're just kind of like that person. You bring it out in me. Um, and I, I don't know what that is. Um, I know that inherently I'm that way um, as it is already. So it's not hard for me to want to be in that place. That's kind of where I am when I go into the mountains. You know, that's how I am to begin with. But uh, it's easier to like, there's this almost calm, collected, confident nature that you have about yourself with life and where you are and where you sit. And I'm able to certainly resonate with that and commune uh, as brothers with it. Um, and, and so, you know, because I'm in on my own so much and because I spend so much of my time alone, uh, it's, you know, it's really nice to kind of be able to have these conversations and hone in and kind of like really focus on, you know, a, a little bit of the why behind, uh, why we do it and a little bit of the, you know, the reasoning, um, it's like getting into the mind of, and I think that the biggest takeaways that people can have listening to something like this, it, it can, it, it can, it's more of a spiritual journey than it is a journey of killing. It, it truly, the killing's going to happen. The arrowing is going to happen. It, it's the journey. And anyone who wants to be successful should focus on their journey way more. The, be excited about packing your bags. Be excited about planning your trip. Be excited about the new stove you bought and the, you know, what it's like to shoot your arrows and wind and be excited to like put on that weighted pack and train or go for a jog or, um, you know, let your wife know you're going to shoot some arrows or take your kids outside and shoot bows with them. That journey that got you to the point of drawing back on the animal of your dreams for that season that you're going to put an arrow into and that let there be no God complex in it. Let there be no ego in it. Let there be no look at what I did you know, just stoke, just stoke and gratefulness for the moment to be there one day. Hopefully if I'm lucky enough and I don't fall off a cliff or something crazy, like hopefully I'll sit there and, and be able to see like my grandkids running around laughing and be able to tell them star stories. Hopefully they, you know, want me around as like a camp cook or something. <laughs> I, I just, <laughs> You know, this life is so beautiful and I'm just so um, appreciative of of great people that I can share my heart with and like like yourself, like the, this moment right here. Um, that what I'm saying doesn't get lost in the chaos of this world, that it still has meaning somewhere and that I can connect in a place. That's why the outdoors and and our community of people are so wonderful because I feel like when people are focusing on things like web three and, um, you know, soup quantum computing and virtual reality and like augmented reality. And it's just like, wait, what, you know, the world is wild enough as it is. Why do we need this? You, you, how about just to step back from your computer and go to the mountain, go for a hike and watch the sun go down. Like wh what is all of this? I feel like we're as hunters and as outdoorsmen, we're in a unique opportunity to let the rest of the world know what it's like to still be connected. And that in, in many ways, we're being portrayed as like the enemy. And it did say like, not, not that, you know, religion and everything should tie into this super, super much. So I, it doesn't matter to me, you know, what, what anyone believes in and I won't bring it to that level, but I, I would, I would even venture to say that, you know, in, in my belief, I've, I've read oftentimes that during the end times and not that we're close to that or anything like that, I'm not insinuating anything, but that, you know, the most pure of intentions will be tried to be shown as 
you know, evil, um, veiled. And I think it's interesting because we have this unique opportunity that there is still time to have a voice to connect people to what is real so they don't become lost into what they think is real. There's a lot of Gen Z nowadays that is super into, like, for example, I'm in the art community, so Web3 is this new version of Web2, and Web3 is, you know, the sandbox and NFTs and crypto and blockchain. And, and I'm pretty heavily immersed into that technology from an art perspective. We're getting ready to mint some NFTs and, and doing some things in the blockchain ethos. And it's really interesting where Gen Z is taking their lives. Like there's these glasses that you can put on like something. I don't even wear sunglasses, but like, you know, you wear sunglasses to protect your eyes. Uh, people aren't even wearing them for protecting their eyes from the sun's damage. They're wearing them so that that way they can be plugged into Wi-Fi and it can display over their head, like what their NFTs are, what crypto punks they own, what, you know, board ape they have and that's their flex like that's their lambo in life that's their that's their flex like it's crazy because these some of these things are worth tens of millions of dollars and there's these little icons that will pop up in somebody's meta wallet that they put these glasses on and people that are walking around and gen z and 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 millennials and, and they can, they're so into this ethos, this VR augmented reality type Web3 ethos that, that that's the new flex, dude. You and I are so far removed from it that we're like, uh, we're Neanderthals. We're dragging our knuckles, bro. <laughs> we're like, and, and you know what's funny? Blissfully so. Like, I don't even care. I want nothing to do with it. I'm like, I, I have no idea why. That's a flex. But if you have this NFT, it like gives you special act access to these incredible parties with these great DJs. And, you know, you're a member because you got the NFT before anybody else did. And and it's a limited number. And if you don't have one, like you're out. And I'm sitting here going, you've got to be kidding me, right? So because I'm human and because I'm a good human and because I care about like things that are important, like. I'm never going to matter to this community. And it's almost, and there's bigger and bigger communities of these type of things happening <clears throat> that, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say it's all bad, <clears throat> but to say it's not concerning um, the disconnection between nature and earth and those things that are going on technology wise is totally scary. Pretty soon, people aren't going to even know what it's like to camp. They're going to be like, what do you mean camp? And if the electricity goes out, oh, my God, their world's totally over because blockchain doesn't exist anymore. And Web3 and quantum computing is completely, like, gone, right? It's funny. Like, if, if the cell phone's not charged and there's nowhere to plug it in, it's kind of like world panic and chaos. It, it is such a weird thing to think that you are are the wild west like we are literally what's remaining of the wild west oh that's wild to think about isn't it that is crazy so far removed from the wild world and and i could even make a case for a lot of the world problems or you know i think like the the goal in life is personal happiness. It's to find your path through life, and, and and it's to enrich the people around you that you love, your family and your friends. And and you can't enrich people's life unless you find your own happiness first, unless you love yourself first. Like I think that's such a a major key component of it. And and the same way, dude, I appreciate these these conversations that we're able to have. Like you, um, 
uh, we're on the same wavelength, but you almost get me to think deeper about my own life and my own interaction with nature, which is wild. And it's it's one of the things why we you know we have to share a hunt together and go uh, not only have these conversations, but laugh and joke around and and help each other be successful. It'd be so fun to share the mountain with you. So we've got to make that happen. But I just I, I enjoy your perspective on things and, and the way you think about it. You're such a, a critical thinker and think deep like uh, uh, with your, your self-reflection uh, about uh, how you can improve your interaction with this, with this world and improve your own life. But I, I think um, – like like back to uh, uh, you know falling in love with um, uh, the mountains. I think you to to be successful, it's not falling in love with the accolades. It's not falling in love with the success of just being there with a the mountain. And if I'm being totally honest, I have mixed feelings when I kill a buck. Like um, you are taking that life, and it's a bit of happiness for achieving my goals. It's a bit of sadness for taking that buck's life. Like it's these mixed feelings as I walk up. I'm, I'm, I'm not fist bumping in the air. Sure. I get excited when I, when I close a deal on a target buck that I've been working really hard for, but I have these, these mixed feelings with doing it. And I think it's, it's not about, uh, falling in love with the accolades or being a hero or being admired by, uh, your community. Like, like, sure. I'm like you, like, I like a pat on the back. I like doing well. I like being successful. I like accomplishing my goals. Uh, but more than that, I think the takeaway is exactly what you were talking about is is falling in love with the process, not the results, falling in love with all the little things, the the working out, the scouting, the shooting your bow, the the looking at maps, looking at Google Earth, the 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 anticipation for a for a hunt, the excitement of getting your gear together and and knowing you're going to immerse yourself in the mountains like I I think to be successful at hunting mule deer, you have to fall in love with the entire process. And it's a it's a lifestyle. It's not just one week out of the year. And maybe you only get a week or two to hunt a year, but it's more than that. It's it, it it's 365 days of working hard towards these goals, but it's falling in love with it. Like when I'm running the trails uh, – like it's a bit of paying my dues to the mountains, but it's it's being immersed in the mountains where now I've just fallen in love with it, and it's a part of me. Like trail running isn't something I have to make myself do. It's something I'm drawn towards, something I feel that that, that I that I want to do, that I love doing. And it's, it's weird to fall in love with something that takes such hard work, but that's falling in love with mule deer hunting. Like it takes so much hard work and effort. It's a type two fun, and these hunts are tough. Uh, but I, I think it really is falling in love with the entire process of it. And if you fall in love and embrace this this process of bow hunting mule deer and you work it at every different facet of it, uh, every different skill set, and it's not about drawing some high price tag and showing up and shooting this giant 200 inch plus deer like it's more than that it's about building your skill set to show up at these trailheads and be undeniable to know that you put in the work and you've dedicated your life to years of this to to where you're prepared to take on these mountains and give yourself a good chance of success and if you ne if you don't work on those skill sets if you don't fall in love with the process you know sure you might get lucky every once in a while but you're not going to find that consistent success i think that consistent success comes from a love for the for from everything involved in bow hunting mule deer yeah it does it, it it's not it, it it is definitely <clears throat> it is not a lack of love it's not a desire to kill i have no desire to kill you hit home when you said you have mixed emotions and mixed feelings um I'm not going to lie. Like there's times that I walk up on a deer and not because it's big or not because it, mostly because I see my own life passing by and I see these moments that are so precious. They're so incredible. Like I'm not going to be past being a grown man and saying that I'll shed a tear. Like my eyes will get watery. I'll see everything just passing by and I'm just humilitous and grateful, like totally thankful. And, and like to take it off of a serious note here. I mean, if we get in person, you know, 
I'm not sure what you're going to think because I'm the biggest freaking goofball on planet Earth when I'm with, you know, anybody on the mountain. And probably because I lack socialization so much that when I'm winter, when I'm around somebody, they're probably like, whoa, dude, like freaking calm down. You know, I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, you know, the biggest goofball in the world. But, yeah, the critical thinking is always there. Like it, it's it doesn't matter if I'm uh, trying to get you to look down at your shirt so I can, you know, flick my finger up at your nose or if I'm trying to sack tap you from the back. You know, if you're walking past me or something like I'm I'm horrible. I'm like the mountain bully. A lot of my friends call me the mountain bully because I'm bad. I you know, you're going to have fun for sure with me. Um but there's not a moment that goes by that I'm not committed and dedicated to the one reason why we're there to begin with is to ensure your success, to work hard on making sure that we come out heavy to take in the moment, embrace every moment of suck because the moments of suck are the most important moments that we ever experience on the face of this earth. There is nothing that defines us by sitting on the couch. There's nothing that defines us by taking it easy or sleeping in or, you know, making the excuse to like eat like crap or think that, Oh, I can wait to, for tomorrow, tomorrow before you know it, it'll be right in your doorstep. Like it'll be right there staring you in the face. And the only thing you can sit there and say is, did I prepare? Did I, did I do everything I could to like leave everything on the field? and make everything count right now it's very 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 profound and um it's something that like really rings home so i i'm very um just in agreement with everything you say i don't sit there and think oh man he's got it so backwards and twisted like i i sit there and truly think to myself he's got it figured out and he's right in his brian is right in his wheelhouse he's where he needs to be that's a pretty neat place to be able to because there's a lot of people you can probably vouch for this that you'll see you're like wow that person is truly searching for their place they're truly searching for you know what that is in life for them. You're one of the people I sit there and go, he's found his place. He knows his purpose. He knows why he's doing this. And it's not, um, it's not a guess for him. It's interesting that as we go along this journey, that we have this, this obligation, this responsibility, right? Like we didn't ask for it. It's not something that, um, we planned or anticipated for. It's just that when you start doing something and for whatever reason you get to where it seems like it's easy, but it's not, but for whatever reason, people start to sit there and go, okay, well, I notice something is a little bit different than normal here it garners attention. Some of it is unwanted. Some of it is cool, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter either way to you. But then just comes this responsibility. You don't really have a choice over. You have to figure out what to do with it because ultimately you're in that position now. So you got to step up. I kind of feel like that's a little bit about what hunting and being in the outdoors has become for me. It's not something that I necessarily knew was going to happen. I had no clue. It didn't really matter to me. And in a lot of ways it, it doesn't, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's still about just being in the mountains. Um, but trying to like, you know, be in a place where I can care about things a lot more than just about my own experience and helping usher in others experiences and being encouraging and setting the right tone and helping others to like know that, you know, with passion and with love, with dedication and commitment and enjoying that journey that 
they can also be that very same version of themselves and find themselves in this thing that is so great that we call bow hunting. Um, whether it's for elk or mule deer or anything, it's that journey and it's such a precious one. So, boy, it so is. Yeah. I, um, in the same way, like I, I had this, this love for it, uh, whether people were watching or not. And, and, you know, I actually got judged in a different light earlier in my hunting career where, you know, I was hunting and, um, you know, I was able to articulate it to, to my wife and to my kids about, uh, you know, living this dream and being gone and, and taking these trips to the mountains and really chasing what I love. And they got to see me put in all the hard work. They got to see me run all these miles and, Nobody was watching. Nobody was paying attention. Nobody was was watching me shoot my bow day in, day out. Nobody was watching these goals and dreams I had. Nobody was watching me run these marathons and ultra marathons preparing for these tough hunts. Uh, my wife and kids did. They could appreciate it and supported me. But I almost got judged in an opposite light where people thought I was neglecting my family or neglecting my work to go do this bow hunting and would, would look at me in a negative way. And now, you know, after – I start to find success and I start to be the bow hunt. These same people that had this negative viewpoint of me now say, you know, well, that's amazing. He goes on these adventures. He's still a dad, still a husband. So this perception totally changed about me. And you're right. I didn't, I didn't set out for that. I did it for this love of it. This, you know, I found what I loved in life and I, I, I really enjoyed the entire process. So I started working at it and same thing. In the hunting industry, I started sharing these stories through writing and this this writing, you know, it's a another medium where you really get to think about your word choice and what you're saying and and, and really craft it to be able to get your point across. And it, it 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 started resonating with guys or I started this podcast seven years ago now where I just got on a mic and I started talking and I didn't know what I was doing or what I was even talking about, but I was talking about my love for this. And it's amazing, like, how many people it resonated with, like, how many people gravitated towards it, how many people uh, support me through it and and found this podcast and love it, uh, love my writing. And now, like, I've built this following that I didn't really plan for. And so you're right, is that now I have this responsibility, this responsibility to try to enrich these other people's lives this responsibility to protect this this bow hunting that i love pr pr protect these mule deer that i love this habitat and um uh, uh protect my community that that also loves it and it it's just um it, it's such a trip to me how this can just start from this passion and this dream and all of a sudden you know, I'm I'm 42 years old and have all these people that support everything I do, uh, that give me positive encouragement, that that also send me messages about how it enriches their life and how they've been able to make these changes not only to their bow hunting but to their family life, to be better husbands, to be better fathers. Like that is a powerful thing. Not only when you when you start making your own life better and you find this joy and happiness and, and this love for yourself. And I've been able to, like you said, build my identity around this, build my confidence through this. And then I've been able to apply it to other facets of my work life and other facets uh, of my, my life with my friends and my life with my family. And this was all taught just through this love of wild places and, and this love of this wild interaction with nature. And I've been able to learn all these lessons from it. And it, it does. Like I, I, I get, you know, a bit hippy dippy or uh, introspective when I, when I talk about it or when I think about it, but all those feelings are so real to me and they've been so real to me for the last 20 years. And, and the only thing that changed is more people are listening. Like I've, I've been able to get this voice, you know, where, where people pay attention to what I'm saying or pay attention to how I'm living my life and want to emulate it and, and find happiness in their own lives. And I, to have such great impact in, in my one chance at life here and to find what I truly love to do, like, uh, it, it's just been such an amazing journey. And, and not only do I want to continue to, to help guys find their own happiness, to, to help my daughters find happiness in their life and, and to find, uh, 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 success or to find their passions and, and things that they can, you know, to find their ambitions and their dreams and to, to have these goals and to find their own happiness. 
Uh, but but now it's uh, after I find my own. Now I can I can help other people, and it's just amazing to get a voice like that in a community that I love. And it's it's like nothing I planned on, and it's something that just grows little day by day. And um, what what an amazing life that we get to live, Marlon. It's um it's just out of this world. It is it is it is special. It is very special. It doesn't always come in a pretty package with a bow on it, but it, it is very special and I'm appreciative of it, appreciative of it every single day. It, it's funny. I, I never do those uh, Instagram, like ask me a question posts uh, on the, on your story. And um, a couple days ago I opened, opened it up to, you know, just ask a question and I, I respond to DMS um, quite a bit. Like it's, it's almost, um, it's a, it's a giant time grab to try and respond to the DMs. Like the DMs kind of get out of control. It's almost like you turned into like some thoughty thirst bucket on social media because you're a good bow hunter, Brian, like I'm sure you get, I know you get it too. It It's weird. Like you're desirable in some way because you have something. So I usually respond in DMs, but I open it up to this, ask me a question thing. And it was really cool um, to watch how, you know, it, it's not like the public answers that you give. It's the results down the line that people give you back like their success stories hey i did you know what you were talking about um i heard it on this podcast or i you know when you respond to that dm i went back and you know i located that buck and, and here he is and if i could go back and show those i'll tell you right now that's why i do it and th and that's why I opened it up and I did that the other day. I already got messages back of I've located the biggest buck I've ever found using the tactics that you were talking about. Or now I understand what you mean when you say roll your feet. Like it's funny because I haven't taken my boots off on a stock in 16, 15 years, dude. Like I don't take my boots off. They're, they're the most important tool that I have, like next to my bow or my back. Like it's all important, but like I'm not taking my boots off. That is goofy. To me, that's the goofiest thing in the world. People are going to be like, what do you mean you don't take your boots off? I'm like, I don't take my boots off. Like, why am I going to take my boots off? If I don't have my boots on, I can't really cover any ground or get anywhere or do anything. People are like, well, how do you get in close? I said, I don't need to take my boots off to get in close. I just get in close. And it's like lost on. It's like this huge question mark over there. I'm like, what do you mean? I said, it's not about the sound. You're going to make sound. It's about the sound you make. Nature, there's sounds all around you. It's happening all the time. There's, there's sound everywhere. And that like totally like, that, I think that's probably one of the biggest things that people are like, what do you mean? You know, it totally freaks them out. And they're like, okay, I don't understand that. You're going to have to like, you know, make a video series on this because like everybody takes their feet, their, their boots off. Everybody wears bare feet. I'm like, what are, those are goofy. Like I've tried to use those before and all they do is collect a bunch of crap underneath them. And next thing you know, you're walking on all the crunchies that you don't want to crunch. Like, I don't wear those either. You know, I, I just, I just use my boots. That's it. Just use my boots and I take it easy and get in and arrow the buck. And so that's interesting to kind of like, um, do my best to share information and critically think and help others think outside the box and really be a part of a community that I care so much about to help them. I've heard, I've gotten, I, I've gotten hate on the other side of it. I've gotten hate 
why are you teaching people how to do this? We don't need any more people being any better. There's less, there's few animals as it is. Uh, these, you know, there, there's units that are getting up and it's like, gosh, calm down, stop. Think for a moment, like people are going to be out in the woods no matter what. I'd rather help be part of the solution in making sure that people are out there doing the best they can to want to improve and learn and become better at their craft than not be a part of the solution, just be a part of the problem and be one of the lurkers in the shadows that hates. I'm going to do everything I can to be a literal ray of light in the world. And anything that has to do with anything negative, I choose to just push it away. I don't need it because we allow energy in. We choose who we become and what we are. And I'm going to choose to be everything that I feel in my heart is, is good and that um, won't hurt others that will add to people's lives. I've taken a stance in my life that in order for me to want to do something, it has to add to somebody's life. It does not behoove me make me feel like a better person, um, make me feel like I'm getting ahead to use anybody ever. I don't, it, I get no satisfaction out of it. I don't care about your hunting spot. I don't care about, you know, what kind of bucks you can help me kill. I, I don't care about how I can get ahead off of leapfrogging from your back. Like I want to do it on my own. And if somebody is gracious enough to say out of love, man, I want to share something with you. It's really special to me. Like, I want to be able to hold that sacred. Like when we go hunting together, I want to hold that sacred. It's not because I want to learn something that you can give me that I couldn't do on my own. I want to commune as brothers and do something as tribal members in a society of hunters that provides for their families in a different way to be able to commune with that brotherhood and on a greater scale on these social media platforms, be able to be a part of a solution that is much greater than myself to do something for a community that I'm passionate about and that I love. And I think that's what really where I kind of, um, you know, draw the line that that's where I stand today. Such a, a great line to draw. It's, um, and it, it's such a fulfilling life to to live your life that way. I, lo- I just um, really resonates with me, like not letting that negative energy in, like choosing what I let in and what I don't, choosing the life I want to live. And um, man, that, that's a beautiful thing and a fulfilling way to live your life is to look at things that way, how it's going to uh, either help or enrich somebody's life or um, or I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to take part in it. And those, um, he sent me some, some photos. Oh my gosh. The, those things are amazing. Um, how, how do I like, uh, switch gears here, but how do I, how do I get some of these prints from you and frame some of this artwork to put in my house? Like I have some beautiful pictures, but, uh, these, these pictures of you are the, uh, not even of you, the, the pictures of the landscape that you've taken, uh, are just uh, uh, absolutely moving. Like, how does how does one uh, get a print uh, or frame a print or get these from you or from your art gallery? How does that happen, Marlon? Um, it's uh, all available online. Uh, it's at uh, marlonholden.com, M-A-R-L-O-N-H-O-L-D-E-N.com. Um, it's all there, you, you know, custom orders and everything like that. Just because you're a buddy of mine, I got to get you something. Um, period get you something sent out just so that, that way you can uh, you know if you if, if something resonates there that, that you know makes you think of something that you love about about um, the land uh, or that just you feel you know would be impactful for you I'd, I'd be happy to do that for you um, but uh, yeah I really really that's you know again I'm not, that when I'm out hunting for photographs it's it's almost like hunting mule deer it's like that perfect elusive light and and you know like those moments when you're out in the field and you see it 
like we were above this crystal blue lake. You, you see it in that one photo with the light rays coming through the clouds. I do. It's amazing. Like that morning was like overcast. It didn't seem like anything great was going to happen. And then, you know, you just, you just, I have patience with everything now. I'm not in a rush. I sat up there all day, two days in a row, just whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Like bring it, let, let's see. And, you know, I'll sit there and chew on some jerky. I'll pass out for a couple hours. I'll get up, I'll look around, I'll pass out for like another hour, hike over to a different vantage point. And, and it's funny when you're spending so much time in a place, you, you get curious about stuff that maybe you wouldn't have been curious about before. I'm going to go ahead and hike up to the top of that ridge and see if there's like a different view or angle on this basin. And I did, you know, and I find deer and I'm like, Oh, interesting. Okay. You know, and it, it, it's funny because like, I wasn't even hunting. Like I wasn't even, I'm not even in a unit. I'm going to hunt. Like it had nothing to do with that. I'm there because I, wanted to take pictures of these peaks in this beautiful lake like that's why i'm there like i don't care about hunting there but it's just that your mind can't help but you know go there when you're doing that and that's how i do like a lot of what i do spending so much time in the field is just letting nature take hold of my life letting don't let everyone else's priorities and everything else that you know the world says it has planned for you take control of your life like you put your foot down and you take control of your life and just allow yourself to breathe it's those moments that i have the greatest amount of oxygen i can purify and cleanse every single thought in my head i'm galvanized i can sit there and with this sense of true confidence say this is my purpose this is where i'm supposed to be i am this messenger of the earth to share the light and beauty of this earth with people who've forgotten it. Like it happens all the time in my gallery in Laguna, like people come in and, and they're like, what, how do you do this? And first off, it's not just a picture. It, it's a piece of my heart from a moment in a place that I worked really hard to get to, but that I spent the time, like I didn't care if it happened or when it happened. I'm there to receive whatever comes. Hmm. And if it comes, it comes. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But you can't ever say that you're going to get it. If you don't put yourself there, you got to go, you got to show up. If you don't show up, don't expect anything to happen. Cause it ain't going to happen. If you didn't practice plan to fail, like you can either plan to win or plan to fail. And I'm going to just show up and be patient and let be what be and let come what's going to come and, and allow that to be manifested in everything that I do in life. And th that moment, for example, among others, you know, I love, there's nothing I love more than, than those, fleeting few minutes that last most of the time that perfect light lasts less than a couple of minutes where, where, where it's not that hard line on a, on a mountain where the sun comes up and it's really hard where there's a line across the horizon that the sun is shining against the horizon and hitting the mountain. So there's this line against the mountain. It's before that it's when the sun starts to kiss the sky in the east and it starts to blanket the sky as the color starts to fill from east west and then as you look to the west it illuminates the clouds in this pinky orange milky beautiful glow and it just starts to kiss the tops of the mountains with this gold like it's the most phenomenal thing in the world to be a part of, to witness, to like, it's air never tasted so sweet. The world was never so beautiful and it happens every day. Hmm. Every day that you're blessed to be able to wake up, you get to see that. And then these, just these little profound moments, you know, they happen every day, but something about late spring, early summer, 
in high country basins and those photos that I showed you with the paintbrush or the columbine or, or, you know, just watching them crescendo in this perfect moment of their glory. These flowers, they're beautiful. Like, have you ever seen these time lapses, these long time lapses of the growth of a peak flowering cycle? You see them grow and they peak and their petals come out and reach for the sun and, and then they fade away and they wilt. Like, that is a very rapid expression and feeling of exactly how life is and very much so how we are as human beings. We're going to grow, we're going to grow, we're going to grow, we're going to bloom. We're going to become what we are and who we are and, and ultimately who we manifest and choose to be before we will and then go back to the earth. And there's going to be other flowers after us. We could choose to be a flower or we can choose to be a sticker bush. <laughs> like... You know, and there's nothing worse than walking through antelope country without freaking shoes on. Like, when those little bullheaded round suckers get in your heel, like, man, they will make you jump like your kid's Legos on a freaking hardwood floor. Like, I, all I want to do is go see the wildflowers, man. And hunting beautiful light, for me, around the world in these different places is just as rewarding as arrowing a big mule deer. Just as rewarding. Hmm. Man, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm definitely gonna uh, implement that some in in my photography and uh, implement it in my hunting as well. Like, uh, uh, just, just uh, like quite possibly. Well, I know it's the the deepest uh, conversation that I've had on Eastman's Elevated, and uh, quite possibly one of the deepest ones I've had in life. Like, um. Uh, it's so fun to hear your perspective and um, your love for things and how you look at the world. Like um, you're definitely on the right path, and you're definitely le leaving this 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 positive impression on the world. Like uh, uh, you're definitely a flower and not a sticker bush. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, uh, let that be the takeaway. <laughs> that's it, man. Um, seriously, I really enjoy these conversations, and I really appreciate you. And we just need to. Uh, touch bases um, uh, even more often than we do and definitely share the mountain together. But um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. Uh, the feelings mutual, Brian. I, and, you know, before we get on, like, I didn't even know you started pressing record. I'm like, Oh God, what did I say in the first 10 minutes? You know what I mean? But whatever it is, what it is. Um, I sit there and I think to myself, you know, I don't ever intend for them to get super philosophical and, and super deep. Like, I'm totally down to have a conversation where we just talk about tactics and mule deer and strategy. And, you know, like, we can set it off to where one day the tone is just, you know, what do you do? And and that's totally cool. But uh, you definitely bring it out in me. You know, this is definitely an arena for me where that um, is allowed to thrive. So... I'm very appreciative of that and, uh, you know, your time and allowing me to, to share a moment with you on Eastman's Elevated. Be a part of what you're doing, Brian. I think you're doing great things and uh, it's very relevant and plays a huge role in my life. And, and I'm just appreciative of it offline here when we get uh, done, you know, like we need to start setting plans in motion and making sure that 2023 we we're doing something. Let's do it. It's a plan. All right. Thank you, sir. Let's wrap this thing up, and um, we'll uh, get on with our day. So uh, thanks again. Yeah, man. Have a great day. You too. All right, guys. That's a wrap. I warned you. We went deep on that one. <laughs> we... Um, you know, it's, it's just um, it's fun to get in those in-depth conversations of what it means to us and the reason why we do it and the the bigger the bigger meaning of life. And I sure find myself as I as I get older, just um, really appreciating my time in the mountains and reflecting upon my time and uh, just trying to figure out the the, the why and, and and trying to find personal happiness in life. Like it's not easy to be happy in life. And I'm lucky that I have this passion that I love that drives me I'm lucky that I I have this great family that I surround myself with, great friends, uh, but it, it's not easy and it takes work and, 
you know, I'm a student of the game of bow hunting, archery, mule deer. I'm also a student of the game of life, like constantly trying to get better at it. And, um, so anyways, just some, some thoughts, but I told you we'd go deep on that one and we sure did. And I'll have Marlon on again. I'll, uh, we'll sit down and we'll talk just, um, tactics on hunting mule deer as well, as I know that's so beneficial for a lot of you guys to listen to, to, to pick up tips and tidbits there. So, uh, we'll do a, a tactic specific podcast as well. And I'll put that out, but, uh, thanks so much. You guys made it till the end. And, um, yeah, I appreciate you listening in. I really appreciate Marlon coming on the podcast. I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, so yeah, I just want to thank our sponsors. Uh, make sure to go check out Black Ovis, uh, internet retail store, camo fire. Make sure to go check out cutter stabilizers and also Zamberlin Boots. Oh, and that promo code for Black Ovis is Elevated10. Uh, that'll save you 10% off. Uh, it also brings weight to the podcast, lets them know that uh, my audience is engaging with the with them. And, um, yeah, they're just great guys. Talking with that Marcus there. Um, there's a bunch of hunters there in that office and a bunch of guys that listen to the podcast as well, um, which, is, which is great. Um, so yeah, I just really like supporting good companies and um, they're one of them. So couldn't be more pleased with that. Make sure to go check them out if you need anything. Oh, they have that point system. One point is one dollar. Uh, you know, get yourself some free gear on top of that. So um, thanks to those guys. Thanks to you guys. Man, uh, keeping the dream alive of this podcast. I sure enjoy doing it and um, you guys keep listening every week and as long as you keep doing that, I'll keep putting them out. Uh, thanks so much for sharing them with your friends and... Um, uh, yeah, sharing them on social media and, uh, reviews on iTunes and the platforms and things of that nature. Um, man, we just really created like this great community through the podcast and I'm so proud of it and, um, so happy to be doing it. So with that, I'm going to go cut loose in the mountains. I'll make sure to get you guys an update or we'll do a live podcast. I'll do some, some, uh, some sort of media back there. I know we're going to try to film it. I've got a cameraman with me, so, uh, we'll definitely be capturing some video, but we'll try to do, um, some other content while I'm back there and, uh, also try to just cut loose and have some fun and go chase some mule deer. So um, thanks a bunch, guys. I appreciate you. Uh, keep working hard towards your goals.